Hello, I'm Susan Sevilla, and I'm the director of the International Transactional Analysis Association here in San Francisco. And it's my great pleasure to introduce Dr. Stephen B. Cartman, MD. Dr. Cartman is one of the original Eric Byrne colleagues. He attended the Air Force seminar between 65 and 70. He's uh, twice vice president of the International Transactional Analysis Association. He's a two-time winner of the Eric Byrne Memorial Scientific Award. Um, published 30 TA articles in the TA Bulletin, the TA Journal, and the Bulletin of the Eric Byrne Seminar. And he teaches at the University of California, San Francisco, as an assistant clinical professor of psychiatry. He's also in private practice in San Francisco. And with that, I'll turn it over to Dr. Carton. Okay, thank you, Susan. I'm going to um, cover a little bit of the history of transactional analysis, going back to uh, the days that Eric Byrne ran the seminars in the 60s. In preface for all the diagrams you're going to see, Eric once said, don't say anything that you can't diagram. <laughs> so I said, oh boy, that gives me a chance to do some uh, pictures, because I do some painting and some other artwork as a hobby. Originally, transactional analysis started off with structural analysis, uh, using the tools to analyze the individual personality. And, um, and then it went into transactional analysis, um, analyzing the transactions between people. And that got into game analysis. And that's about when I came in and I did the drama triangle. And uh, also got into script analysis. But what didn't get finished was um, uh, and that I took on. I, I stayed pretty much main line while others went on to develop other schools. I stayed in the center and, and worked on uh, intimacy analysis and, and relationship analysis. So one time I thought of, uh, we were having the reparenting and redecision school. So I thought, well, why not have the three R's of TA, like reading, writing, and arithmetic? <laughs> so I said, why not resocialization as one of the three R's? Because people who have problems with sleep back as needing reparenting or redecision, they uh, they may not necessarily have learned the social skills as, the, as they went through life because they, because they have the script injunctions against learning what you need to know. So I felt that most people should be in group and should do some work on, um, on uh, developing their social skills that they missed out on while they were heavily scripted. Um, now, it's, it's a little bit hard in, uh, in therapy to get a person to talk about their transactions with people. Uh, just like in psychoanalysis, the hardest thing you can get a person to talk about is their id. In TA, maybe the hardest thing to get someone to talk about is the actual details of their transactions with people, being at two ends of the scale. So there are different ways of getting it. If you work with a couple, you see it right then. If you do group therapy, uh, you may or may not see some of the games, but quite often what you really want to know about their transactions um, uh, may not show up there. You'd have to actually have them talk about, have to actually ask them to talk about their transactions and how they get along with people and what games they play and what they do. And then uh, another way is to do work, to get the information is to do workshops and that's what I've done quite a few at my home for many years is um, I get my patients together and do a full weekend workshop. You're, you're at one of the workshops. Yeah, um, so it's not always <coughs> easy to get this information. So most of the information comes from working with couples and from observing people and friends. Let's just start at the beginning, just do some general thing about how people get together, and eventually we'll get into the relationship analysis. I see it as an ABCs of coupling. How couples get together, there's a first attraction, and then there's bonding, and then there's communication. So there are different things that, that are available that uh, help you look at the attraction and what happens with attraction. And quite often this comes up in, in doing singles workshops or when single people try and figure out what it is, what it takes to, uh, to get along or to get to, to meet somebody. Um, first is the best friends. Uh, there are four different ways people get together. One is best friends. They just get to talk and over a period of time they get maybe a little more romantic and get closer and eventually over months and maybe some people have a six months uh, uh, point, eventually they they get more romantic and get more into a deeper uh, relationship. Now, if a best friends person meets a romantic person <laughs> system, it doesn't work. The romantic person wants to fall in love at first sight, and just like in the fairy tales, and they want sex and depth and commitment uh, right away. 
And then you can have the practical uh, opener, ways of getting together, in, in which people just get together for practical reasons. It makes sense. They want to get married or they want to connect up for different reasons, and not necessarily romantic or whatever, but it has a practical importance, like two people work together, decide to live together. And then the fourth way is a game playing. That's two people get together for the game. As soon as they win the game, they conquer, then they leave. So now this system has been around. I'm not sure where it started. But you can see the problem if one person is a romantic type and the other is a game playing type, then the game player will, will wind up uh, making the romantic person bitter over time because the romantic person will think it's for real and the game player will have, have split and gone on. And the, um, the best friends person may be very upset that the romantic person is pushing them too fast. So you have different ways of couples getting together. And, uh, uh, and they don't always get together the same system, and they keep thinking something wrong with them, or they turn off to the, to the system. But people have different script reasons for, for these different roles, best friends, romantic, practical, game playing. They have different script reasons, but they're all okay. Each person has their own approach. It's just puzzling when people meet people for the first time, and two, three dates go by, and it doesn't click. They don't know that there's actually another system. Mm. The romantic will think that that's the only system, and the best friends will say, wait a minute, I saw... Laura Schlesinger on TV, on the radio, say that, that uh, for all people they should wait six months. Well, that's the, that's the best friends approach, and the romantics will long be gone. Now, the problem with the best friends, if you want to wait six months before there's physical uh, relations, maybe all the romantic and uh, highly charged and lustful people and highly sex people will have left your life, and all you're left is with people who have low sex drives. And then when the time comes for the best friend to turn on, all of a sudden the person they're with saying, hey, I thought we were sort of friends and I don't like sex that much, you might say. So their problems and gains reach these types. The people are, but each are okay and they get along okay. It's just one way of explaining what happens. Now, sometimes the attraction is, uh, is, goes according to, believe it or not, uh, sibling order. Like the oldest in one family is attracted usually to the youngest in the other family. There's a chemistry there. Who knows why? But quite often that has more to do with attraction than whatever was going on between the mother and the father. So in this system here, uh, these, this stands for older brother of brother. Maybe an older brother of brothers might get along well with the younger sister of sisters. Or an older sister with lots of brothers would get along best with the younger brother. Uh, that has a sister, uh, lots of sisters. Usually this counts only for the first six years of life. If you have children that are, say, ten years apart, it doesn't really count. It's, mm. it's when they're home together that it, that it counts. And um, if you're in the middle, for instance, you could have a little bit of both. You could look like a, a, a youngest, or you could look like an oldest, or if you're the youngest, or if you're in the middle, or the only child, you could... Uh, have a situation where you could either go either way. And if your parents were mostly uh, the youngest in their family, then more than likely if you're the middle, you'll take on the role of the oldest. Or if the parents were both older siblings in their family, more than likely your role, if you're the only, would be the youngest of the middle. Quite often the middle sibling can go either way. Now there's an interesting game that you can play. You can sort of look at people, and there is an intuition exercise we can do. You can sort of look at people and sort of sense, well, this, is, this person looks like they come from a family of brothers, and they, they're in charge. They're sort of a responsible person, so they're probably the oldest. The youngest is usually more charming and playful. The oldest is more respond, uh, responsible and dependable. So they connect. And if you think back over perhaps your relationships that worked or didn't work, or you think of uh, friends of yours uh, who gets along together, usually it's the oldest with the youngest. Well, what happens when the two youngest get together? Quite often they fight. Each one wants the other one to go 60% of the way, and they, <laughs> they battle. And uh, what happens when the two oldest get together, they, uh, they often want to be in charge and want to take care of the other one. They don't like the other one to be that competent. They always want to do things for the person. It could roughly correspond on an egogram. Perhaps the oldest looks more uh, parental and the youngest looks more child. So how many people can guess what mine is, which one of those mine is? <laughs> Sometimes people guess it right. I'm the younger brother of sisters. Usually a person who comes from all brothers' family will have a 
real strong Marlboro man, tough guy. <laughs> Particularly if he's the oldest, and the youngest brother will also maybe have that look that he's been beaten up a lot by his older brothers, <laughs> so he winces with him when he's around men. So this is from an old uh, uh, a book is quite a few years ago. I remember Galen Palmer brought it and, and taught it at the Eric Byrne seminar once, and I thought that was pretty good. Now there's a new book that's out on that. Then in terms of attraction and getting people connected, I came up with an idea called the Kid Grid. And that's an intuitive exercise that I do in the intuition workshops, which you can look at a person and do an assessment, that whether they're a turn-on or to you, or whether they're giving a come-on that they want to meet you, or whether there's a certain amount of openness so that you could talk things through with them, or after you've talked things through with them, whether there's any depth. Now, you can, uh, then you can rank a person, like a person who's a turn-on to you, you give them a plus, but there's no come, come on, they don't want to meet you, give them a zero. But you think there's some openness there that you could talk things freely without really having to tug at information. And then there's a depth, you might see depth there. So that person would be a plus zero, plus plus. Well, let's look at some other examples. Um, the, uh, I had one woman once in therapy who went after men who are turn on. There was no come on, they weren't interested in meeting her or anybody that particular day. Um, <laughs> openness, there was no openness whatsoever. But she thought that there was some depth there, that if she worked real hard and made this person a project, that person would come to live and, and, uh, and then be her mate. So she had a try-hard driver, and she was working very hard to get people to, uh, uh, to, to uh, buy her act. So you can have any combination of this, these uh, turn-ons and come-ons and openness and depth. So that's uh, another way of looking at attraction. Is you, if you're working on attraction, you look at what signals people send out. You can also do the transactional diagram, and you can do an egogram to show the number of, uh, you know, what the person's presenting that the other people see. So that might be the first stage in working with, with people who are trying to uh, bond, link up. <clears throat> then from attraction, I'm going through the uh, ABCs here of coupling. First attraction, let's talk about bonding. This is once people get together, uh, what, what creates the bond? What makes, what makes things go um, deeper for them? One way of looking at it is Eric Byrne's relationship diagram, which is in one of his early books. And he says you need half of the, of the uh, communication lines between people open. So suppose there's a child-child turn on between people. Uh, that could be the opening uh, uh, invitation. Or it could be a parent to parent. They could have things in common that, that they, uh, the same background and uh, same interests, same values. So maybe they have uh, two of the nine possible links. Then suppose the, uh, let's put the, the man on the, on the left. Suppose uh, the man respects the woman's thinking and how she, she uh, thinks and how she goes about her work. Well that would be a parent to adult uh, channel. And then what if she also likes the way he thinks and the way he solves problems and the way he goes about his work and she respects his adult? Then you could have, from parent to child, the man wants to care for the woman. From time to time, if she's helpless or she wants some, you know, plays into that scene, he's willing to come forth and, and help her when she asks. And likewise, she can be nurturing to him when he wants to be a little boy or taken care of or, or if he's hurting. So... You know, you should, these are the different kinds of channels. Then you have the problem-solving channel, adult to adult, where they, they're in their relationship, they can sit down and talk things over. They can get into their feelings and into uh, actually solving problems would be adult to adult. And then adult to child would be a, a teaching channel where, say, the man wants to learn from the woman. She has something to offer, maybe using stereotypes. Maybe she has more social skills than he does. And... Um, or I guess from adult to child, she wants information from him. We use a stereotype. Like he has lots of information that she wants to learn from him. And maybe from her adult to his child, she has things to teach him in her business or in, uh, in a social setting that she can do things that he can't do. So here you have like nine possible channels of communication. In this example, they're open. Now I've sometimes looked at, at talk shows and looked at the relationship between the... Uh, the uh, 
the host and their sidekick. And quite often, just about all the channels are, are open. And if you can think about the relationship in your family between your mother and father, for instance, like how many of those channels were open? Mm -hmm. Or between you and a sibling, how many were open? Or between you and one of your parents or both your parents? It could also be at work. You could uh, look at your relationship with your boss, or if you're the boss, uh, the relationship with your clients or your, your, um, your employees or, or slaves or whatever you do. <laughs> and um, so you can, you can have, uh, ideally, Byrne said you need five of the channels. You need half of the channels are open and you have a relationship. If you only have a few, for instance, the relationship starts off child-child with a one-night stand, and there's nothing much to substantiate it. No parent respect for the other person or no parent similarities. It may not work, even if there's good adult communication at first. Um, likewise, if a relationship starts off, say, parent to parent, the two people meet in the country club and, or in the stock market, whatever it is, and they have very similar background values and have a lot in common, but they wait and wait, and the turn, turn on never appears. The child child never comes on. So they try real hard to fall in love, but it never happens. Likewise, when a when a relationship breaks up, like one by one, these, these sticks come falling down. For instance, they start arguing about politics. So let's n knock off the parent-parent. And then one doesn't respect the other one's thinking, if they could possibly be a, a conservative or a, or a uh, liberal. And then after they fight enough, the child-child goes, the sex goes, the friendship, the relationship goes. And then they get to the point they can't argue. They can't discuss things. They argue. So the adult adult goes... So one by one, as a relationship deteriorates, and this could be at work or at home or in a family, the, uh, the lines of communication, the channels, um, are fall, fall down. So you can look at a relationship. Say if you have a, a therapist and you have a favorite client, probably most of these are open. The client, um, you can learn from the client, adult to child, and the client wants to learn from you. The, the client respects you, parent to adult. And then you respect your client. You, you, you think of your client as a person who can think and can, can, um, can solve problems and is working in therapy. Also, the parent-child. Sometimes you have a client that's, that's very supportive of you and you, you sort of feel comfortable with them. They, you know, they may ask you how you are or something like that without it being a, an overt manipulation for you to lower the fee or something. <laughs> and, uh, so, and then they would need to feel that you genuinely care about them That'd be your, your parent to their child. So you can look at the samples of, of relationships and, and figure out how substantial they are. Okay, another thing, this, so this will be a bonding, showing the development of a bonding between a couple that has the initial attraction we talked about. Another uh, longer term bonding, and, and when there are problems in bonding, we use a system that I've seen in several places. I don't know the source of it. But in a relationship, you're, each person ranks the other person, whether they see them as a brother first. Mm. Sometimes there's not necessarily any love going on. A guy's romantically interested in this woman, and they play around a lot, but she sees him as her brother. So she would, have him as, she would rate him as brother first. Maybe he's at work and he takes care of her, and, uh, uh, you know, and he's, she's an underling and she, he gives her support where they're pretty equal, but she may see him as a father figure. But in this particular case, she saw him as a son figure, second, that he was a, like a playful little brother and she was an older sister. Unfortunately, he was an older brother, too, mm -hmm. although those can work. Um, so she had these ranked, and she had lover last. Well, when she looked at him, it just never clicked. You know, he, <laughs> he was interested, but it didn't work. You can also, these can be ranked in any order, and you can take a look at your relationship, uh, perhaps we could peer up and each of you could, could rank somebody that you know that way. And also rank yourselves. How do you come on? Do you come on as a, as a brother or sister first? Do you come on as a strong father or mother that would take care of someone and be supportive? But maybe not be playful as a son and daughter or level, lover? So this system's been around. I don't know where it started, but it's good if you're in a setting where you can, where you can rank these. But... Quite often, working in individual therapy, you don't get a chance to get down to this, these kind of bare bones of what a relationship is, because usually they want to talk about their feelings or their issues or perhaps uh, script issues. 
So <laughs> some things, some of these things you don't don't get to, and you may need to do workshops for your clients, or you, or just do couples work. Have them bring in their their uh, partner. I've had work situations where the two people are clashing at work, and they come in, and I actually work with these two coworkers as a couple, and usually just takes a couple sessions to work things out because uh, you're not de dealing with script issues, you're dealing more with, with social skills issues. Okay, so this is bonding. So we got the ABCs going, so you got the attraction, the bonding, and the last is would be communication. So assuming that um, they bonded well, last is communication, and I guess you could use Burns diagram of if you have um, just complementary transactions, he talks adult to adult to her, and she talks adult to adult back. That's good communication. Mm -hmm. Or if they want to take care of, he comes home from work and says, I've really had a rough day. And instead of her saying, don't tell me your troubles, <laughs> uh, she comes back and says, poor baby, let me make you some coffee or whatever. Or it could go the other way. She's had a rough day, and, and she asks for support, and he... He gives the support rather than, than trying to fix the problem. Like one situation recently, this woman was working on it, trying to learn her computer, and uh, and she was throwing up her hands and she says, "I'm going to get rid of this computer. I'm going to throw it out the window." And instead of him saying, "Poor baby," or "Tell me more about it," he goes there right away to fix it. But that isn't what she wanted. She wanted to, to just express her feelings and get it out. Um, there's one old exercise that sees the woman as a, this is sexist of course, but these old ones are, uh, so the uh, sex role activists, if you're offended, put up your hands, and, and uh, okay. I've often thought there's an organization out called Olios, that's the Opportunistic Legion of the Easily Offended, and, uh, and uh, they, they go to lawyers a lot. So, uh, I even forgot my example, that's doing, um, so, what was the example? <laughs> Help. Okay. So the computer so is sexist and or fixing sexist. it. Oh, yeah. Sexist. Yeah, they said that, uh, that a woman will, actually a woman mentioned this the other day. She said a woman is like a tumbler, like it's half full of emotions. And until she can spill and empty all the emotions out, she's not ready to listen and fill it up with logic. And, <laughs> and that the man, he's got this tumbler half full of, of logic mm -hmm. until he can dump all his logic only then will he be able to listen to the feelings. So quite often, uh, men from Mars, women from Venus, that kind of thing. Transactionally, it would be uh, she, the woman's going through a lot of feelings and very upset and just wants him to be a listener. So she goes child to parent, to nurturing parent, to get, be supported. Mm -hmm. But he comes back and cross the transactions adult out to fix it. So the next move in the game is that she accuses him of being Mr. Know-it-all and Mr. Fix-it and never listening to her feelings. So that's step three. And then step four is, is that uh, then he goes into his child and feels unappreciated that, that look at all I do for you and you never appreciate what I'm doing. And that goes around and around and that of course is a familiar uh, uh, thing that comes up. Okay, uh, well that looks fine as building relationship. It looks fine to go A, B, C. ABCs of bonding. You get attraction, the bonding, communication looks fine. But there's another ABCs, and that we'll call um, this is what goes wrong. So, first you have agendas. People come into the relationship with an agenda. They have a script, or they have a counter script, or they have certain goals of what they want out of this relationship that may conflict with the other person's goals. Or they uh, it could be a, uh, a cultural scripting. The man feels, well, the woman's supposed to stay home and take care of things, and well, he goes out and hunts the wild bears or whatever he's thinking. And uh, or, so he thinks that she stays home, and he, he's the man in charge. I have this one relationship where he's older than her quite a bit. He says, look, I have more experience than you, he uses that one, and uh, <laughs> therefore you should listen to me. And she says, how with you? And she goes out and does whatever she wants. And... Uh, and it's a tug because the more he gets commanding and, and authoritarian, it's, it's like on a seesaw, the more she gets rebellious and does what she wants and it goes around and around. So people have different agendas of what they want from the other person. People come in with a script, with their, their uh, 
uh, their, their uh, sex role uh, biases, or they have uh, scripts and counter scripts uh, that may or may not conflict. They have different goals, life goals, but also goals for what they want from the other person. So you get the agendas mixed in here. So the next goes the bargaining. <laughs> As, it, as the people try to get um, what they want. Uh, it could be the person wants, uh, say, the stereotype, we use the, uh, the, the Bundy family as an example. Uh, <laughs> Al Bundy wants his wife to cook and, and not bother him with sex, and, and she wants to not cook and to always bother him with sex. And uh, so there's a lot of bargaining goes on, and, and usually it's around the TV set, and... So you have a lot of games around the bargaining because they each have different agendas of what they think a relationship should be and what they want. Also in the agendas could be old trading stamps toward each other and also toward family members. There's a lot of script things that may come up eventually as people get married and some of the parent things from their family click in and some of the transferences click in. They may uh, turn and be a little different person than when everything was ideal in the beginning of a relationship. So when the bargaining fails, then you have conflict. And then you get into people's uh, uh, communication skills, whether they, they know how to, um, whether they know how to talk things through. You get into problem solving, which is what we'll spend most of the rest of the time on. But first I want to just go back to the very beginning on communication and, and, and just look at the values. Is communication Good. I mean, some people are, say if you have the man who's a strong, silent type that doesn't like to communicate, or a stereotype of a woman who's passive and dependent and always wants someone else to do the talking first before she commits herself. You can have different people who don't want to talk or people who are, are pressed to talk too much. So you look at the origins of communication, go all the way back in the value system. Do people think it's a value to communicate? Because if you're just going to a workshop and you go home and you want the person to communicate, and that isn't part of the original contract between the two people, so maybe one person isn't able to communicate, and you've learned all these skills at this workshop or other workshop, you then are increasing the problems because you're changing the contract of the relationship. So some people don't like to talk, and the question comes up, should you say, well, you have to talk because that's what they're saying nowadays, you must do. But the person who doesn't like to talk has learned all their life how to work things out the silent way, how to let things uh, uh, work out, things work out by themselves, or whatever system they use. So let's look at some of the influences of, um, uh, in the communication itself. Okay, first, uh, how does the critical parent look at, it, at uh, communication? Well, one person could believe that uh, communication is just a lot of talk, it's psychobabble, uh, it's not really important, and uh, it's just something you learn in workshops or something trendy, some ear candy for the for the uh, for the uh, newly uh, enlightened, <laughs> and uh, so that could be a value that that it's uh, communication is not important. But you could also have a value that from the critical parent that uh, you've got to talk. Talking is good. So if you have a person that doesn't like to talk or doesn't believe that talking is good, and you have another person who says. You have to talk or else. Communicate with me. I demand it. You know, then you get some problems because this person believes that it's absolutely essential to communicate or uh, things go bad. Then you can look at some uh, nurturing parent reasons for communicating. Well, communication gives strokes. It gives, it's, uh, it's nice. People like to hear themselves talk. They like to help the other person. So a way of giving strokes is by communicating. So the one who doesn't communicate is is frustrating the one who likes to communicate and says, sees communication as a way of giving, giving strokes. Uh, it's also a nice gift to give people to communicate because it lets them know where you are. Uh, mm. So in case they're a little paranoid or mistrustful from old script issues, uh, the more you talk, the, the more they get to know who you are and the more comfortable they uh, are with you. Uh, some adult reasons for communicating. Um, some people communicate only when it's necessary, but they always communicate when it's necessary. They may be quiet when it comes to a problem at work or at home. They will bring it up, but otherwise they, they don't communicate. Um, other adult reasons for com communicating is, is uh, some people just are born with the skills, the verbal skills, and uh, 
just like learning a language, they learn communication very easily and they're good at it. Mm. And if they press it on someone else and demand that the others do it, well, it's not fair. The other may have a better, um, have different skills. So what are some uh, child reasons, some free child reasons for communicating is to, um, would be it's fun. It's fun to chat with people and rap and exchange ideas. Some people get on the phone for hours. Others feel very com uncomfortable on the phone and sort of hang up as soon as they can. <laughs> but it's fun. So if you're not a communicator, the other person may interpret what you're doing as, as not being a fun thing because you're not, you're not the rapping with them. You're not exchanging strokes and playfulness and, and exchanging bright ideas and so forth. Uh, what are some other free child? Um, by, by talking, you get to know the other person, and it's sort of fun. You feel closer to the person. Mm -hmm. um, now I, wrote, I got adapt. This is adapted child. I think I wrote oh. natural child. Okay, the adapted child reasons for communicating is uh, if you're afraid of people, you, you communicate in order to make them less of a mystery. So you can find out who they are. Mm. And uh, an adapted child might communicate because they have to. Um, I mean, they would, in order to adapt, they have to communicate. But it might be very painful and difficult for them to do it and a lot of work. But they would communicate because it's the right thing to do. And they also went to the same workshop that you did. <laughs> so where do the blocks in communication come from? And you can have it in the childhood, the... Uh, Look at the reasons why children clam up. Say the parent is wearing a sweatshirt that says, explain yourself. Well, so, okay, the child might not, might not like the person, so they wouldn't communicate because they don't like the person. Uh, likewise, adults can, can hold back because they don't like them. Like if you call somebody that you had some, a conflict with many years ago and say, hi, I just thought I'd get back together with you. They would say, yeah. And say, well, what's going on these days with you? Yeah. <laughs> so they don't like you, and they're not going to communicate very much by choice. Uh, so the nurturing parent and the child, we're talking about why children clam up. They may clam up because they don't want to hurt anybody's feelings. They think if they tell the parent what they really think, it will hurt their feelings, or, they might, or the parent might be trying to push them to, to get somebody in trouble so they wouldn't talk. Adult reasons for not talking in the child. Uh, they may not have the skills. The, the conversation may be over their head, may be too complex for them. And likewise with an adult that may clam up, say in a process group, that's very dangerous. Anyone who speaks up is going to get shot down. Um, then, then a person would say, this is too complex for me. I can't play this game. I'll just watch. So there's adult reasons not to, uh, to talk. Also, the children may feel they're only supposed to be they're only supposed to talk when they're asked. No one wants their opinion, so they may hold back for, uh, until someone requests it. Uh, free child, they may not talk because uh, they're having more fun with the ideas in their head. They're out thinking of themselves playing outside and, and, um, or thinking of how funny the parents look when they get all serious. You know. <laughs> so they may have different reasons. Or the rebel child might just refuse to talk because that's exactly what the parents want them to do is to talk, so they're going to refuse to talk. Uh, a lot of adapted child reasons for the child not to talk. They're seeing a parent with a sweatshirt that says, explain yourself. Well, they could see it as being dangerous, that things can go wrong. And likewise, in a couple, that relationship, people may not talk because they think, well, talking is the first step toward divorce. So if you're going to say nothing, then, then things will be better. So the adapted child may think some, he's going to or she's going to get in trouble or someone else will be hurt, so talking is dangerous. Or the adapted child may feel that they're not supposed to talk um, and they don't really have anything to say. Okay, so that's some of the reasons for, for not talking. Um, any other reasons for not talking that, that uh, people have that you can think of for not communicating? What they think is a good reason. Well, it's an example right here. Because so. <laughs> one person's doing all the talking, and, and uh, it's a seesaw. The more I talk, the less well, others are being Okay. Yeah, I'm out in the playground. So yeah, okay, I'm out, I'm out in San Francisco going to nightclubs. <laughs> <laughs> you may have been physically dangerous to talk. Or... Yeah, now you could, you could be in a situation where you have an abusive home where it's physically dangerous to talk. Mm -hmm. a dysfunctional family, you see other people 
battering each other, and you think maybe it's better just to sit on the sidelines and watch, and you could take it, the, uh, say, numbed out um, mm -hmm. approach and just numb out and just stay out of the situation because it's more dangerous uh, if you talk. You don't want to get in the middle because you could wind up being a scapegoat. Mm -hmm. Okay, we're talking about why communicate. Here we're getting through diagrams. Remember, Byrne said, don't say anything that you can't diagram. <laughs> so I took on the intimacy and the relationship channel or development of TA theory, as others did. Okay, the intimacy scale has to do with the topics that you talk about. And I, I haven't seen this taken on anywhere. I haven't seen it written by anybody. And I had quite a few people quote this. The intimacy scale has to do with the topics. Mm. So on a 0 to 20% of involvement, let's say this is 100% and very intimate, you have silence. People can sit together and, and they, can, uh, uh, they can enjoy being next to each other or whatever, but it's just silence. Uh, one of the workshop exercises I do is called the bus stop, where this man and the woman are sitting on a bus stop, and there's, the bus is coming in 10 minutes, and he has to work her way across the intimacy scale to 100%. And then, of course, the women say, no, we want to be the one to pick up the guy. And they're usually better at it, actually. <laughs> and they work their way across the intimacy scale. Or you could have people want to say they're new in town and they want to uh, get to know somebody, have some friends. But they have to have something in common. And that's what this intimacy scale gives you, is the idea of, of what to talk about to, to get closer. So let's say they're sitting on a bus stop, so there's just silence. And maybe there's, they look at each other, and there's a little bit, maybe 20% of intimacy. Uh, next is TOP, stands for Things, Objects, and Places. So they say, um, when does the bus come, or uh, what street is this? Or <laughs> Eric Byrne had a great line, that when two people are sitting awkwardly on the sofa together, the guy looks around and says, my, aren't the walls perpendicular tonight? <laughs> 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 so so that, that's sort of the awkward conversation, and it doesn't get anywhere. People work real hard to think of things to talk about, and then it doesn't go any place. Now, next comes at 60% involvement is, I have PI here, it stands for people and ideas, philosophy, issues, psychology. Then you really get into talking about yourself and what you think about, and that gets more involved. And, uh, you know, some people right away think that, if they can get the person talking about philosophy or what they think about life, then you really get to exchange ideas and a little more of yourself is involved in it. Okay, at the 80% level, it's me and you. Mm. So one person talks a lot about myself. Well, I'm into tennis and I'm into this. Yeah. And that actually gives the other person an opening to say, well, why don't we get together someday and do this because we have this in common. But it could be one person on a monologue they just talk and talk and talk, and the other one just listens. And then that nothing happens there. Uh, you could have a sort of a seesaw where one person is asking or playing the game of 20 questions, and the other one just talks and talks, and eventually nothing happens because the seesaw is tilted. One person's been too talkative, and one person's been too quiet. And all of a sudden, it's a quiet person's turn to talk, and there's nothing to say. <laughs> or you could have one person feel that they want to talk all about themselves, which is good so that the other one gets to know who they are, but then it's, it's just one-sided and you wait, later feel it. But all you did is uh, the person did talk, was talk about themselves and you didn't get a chance to talk about yourself. So me and you could be a type of parallel play where one person talks a lot about themselves or the other one talks a lot about themselves. So it's more involved than, than philosophy and issues and people, like current events, but it's, it's, uh, it's still not intimate. And intimate is the last 20%, which is the you, us. Uh, what's going on between us that we're not talking about? What are our turn-ons? What is it we like about each other? Uh, do we have anything to work on? The us talk brings it all the way over to intimacy. It was once pointed out to me that this reads, reads stop, I'm you. It sounds very existential or <laughs> Buddhist or something. I don't know what it means. Stop. But, <laughs> Uh, so the actual topic you talk about can create intimacy. So you could have a couple on a date and, and uh, uh, she, he's trying to say, uh, come up to my, you should see my bedroom, I recently <laughs> decorated it. So she distances it by going back here and saying, 
You know, the history of decoration goes back to the 15th century, <laughs> and she distances it, and he's, and he's saying, yeah, I got a new, new uh, uh, mirror over the ceiling. <laughs> it's interesting, in the history of, of uh, mirrors, uh, you know, they're made from this and that and so forth, and the, so people can distance things by going this way, or you can push it too fast, and quite mm. often that's the problem. A person pushes too fast, and they haven't actually covered the, the getting to know you part. Another thing on, about listening when communica- is listening and communication. This is an exercise we do in group. If you, the group's given a lot of feedback to somebody, and then the person seems to fend it all off. Then you, you, ask, uh, you ask the group, let's have a vote. How much of what we said do you think so-and-so will use? And it might come out 30%. Uh, you know, we don't think he's going to use very much, or she is. She didn't want to hear any of it. I don't think she's going to be listening, uh, using it constructively. Or you can have a person very motivated in therapy who feels secure about themselves and not defensive, and, and they could say, yeah, this, this person always pays attention to group. They go home, they think about it, the next week you get the, the follow-up to it. So listening, so this person's more secure, and this one's more defensive. So I call that the listening scale, and this is something you can just do when you talk to somebody. You talk, and then you just wait and see whether they've heard what you've said, whether they're going to use what you've said. And then you just give them a 30 or 50 or 70, and then you know whether to address the communication issue, either something they're doing or maybe something you're doing. So uh, defensiveness often is what holds a person's listening down. Uh, there are other script, other script reasons as well as maybe they didn't learn how to, to listen. So then I worked up this idea of the adult scales that a person feels more secure and they're a better listener uh, if they know themselves, if they know their good traits and their bad traits, and they, you're not going to surprise them by telling them something good and they say, oh, no, no, that's not me. Mm-hmm. Or if you tell them something negative and they say, what are you talking about? That's what you do. So I worked out the scales and it's good for, uh, for a person to know themselves. Like maybe somebody has three faults. Everyone's allowed three faults, by the way. <laughs> Bad fault. After that, you can do something, but three faults you need to accept. Okay, so on the negative side, they should know what their faults are, know where they come from, know them inside and out, have them discussed with other people, like listen to other people talk about their faults, so that they know who they are and they can say, oh yeah, that's me, but I have other good sides. And then you should know your positive traits. So you can have like a dozen positive traits, so on the scales, you know all the good things about yourself. And believe it or not, all of you probably have 12 to 3, or some percentage like that, of positives over negatives. But if a person doesn't know themselves, then you say, hey, that was really good what you did. They say, oh, no. They'll say, oh, no, no, that's, they won't accept it. And, and uh, so then you don't get uh, listening as good if they don't know themselves. So this is useful, the adult scales. Even as a, uh, an idea that you can use for yourself, that it's, it's good to know your negatives and know your positives. And if you're dealing with a person who doesn't know their negatives and their positives, they're probably defensive and there are probably uh, fewer things that, uh, that you can say to them openly if you're trying to solve problems with them, because uh, they, they will get defensive. Well, historically, we, we worked on, uh, on transactions and scripts, and we got up to the point of game analysis. But what wasn't done in the early seminars before we each went our own direction was intimacy analysis. So this is dealing with the intimacy analysis. There wasn't too much that was written about intimacy then and uh, no analysis of it like we're going to go through here. We talked about intimacy and, and uh, communication in general. Let's look at couples, how they approach problem solving. Now ordinarily if, if a couple has a child-child relationship they can have a lot of fun together but eventually they're missing the parent to parent, uh, similar backgrounds, uh, similar interests. Uh, now this is a very rough uh, economy scale uh, relationship diagram. Byrne had the deluxe one with all the different lines and things. Uh, made it look like you're putting strings between your fingers. Well, the other one I did was the deluxe model. This is the economy model for the for, for uh, relationship diagram. So you get two people together who have a lot of child. They have fun, but maybe it doesn't have much substance. Or you could get two people together who have a lot of parent. They have all the similar interests and background. 
but uh, they wait and wait and the child doesn't mm. come. They can't fall in love or can't get turned on. Um, but let's say the couple gets together, they have both. What's missing is a problem solving channel. They have similar backgrounds and, the, and they respect each other and the parent and the child likes, they like each other to different degrees and turn on even. But there's no problem solving channel over the long run and problems do come up because we talked about the agendas and the bargaining and the conflict. Well, you can have relationships which the, the problem solving channel is up at the parent, like mother knows best, father knows best, I'm the boss, and the other one just goes along with it. So if there's an issue, they, uh, one person solves it and the other one goes along. Or you can have the problem solving channel in the child. The people are very playful and they don't care about problems and they all go do their own thing and they get back together. Uh, so maybe that would work to solve the problems. But generally, what you need is the is the adult to adult. For the tough problems, you need a, a way of solving the problems. And some couples go a certain distance and then they don't know how to talk the problem through. Okay, now let's go into problem solving. Now for that I have what I call the three rules of openness. Bring it up, talk it up, wrap it up. That's opposed to the worst way of doing it, which is to save it up, blow it up, mop it up. <laughs> now, people have different skills. Some people are good at bringing things up. One person's spontaneous, and that's what the other one needs. They can bring up things, and they do it in a harmless way, and that's good, and that invites conversation. Or some people have a problem in bringing it up. They bring it up in all the worst ways, or they can't bring it up at all. Sometimes there's even a think it up that proceeds to bring it up. It takes a lot of work sometimes to figure out how am I going to say to this thing, to this person, how am I going to bring it up because they're, they're going to get mad if I say this or they're going to get even if I say that. So some people have to do a lot of thinking if they don't have the fluid skills that it takes to um, bring a problem up in a way that the other one wants to talk. And it can go both, both ways. One person may not want to talk at all. So the uh, bring it up is one area all by itself. Some people are spontaneous. Some people bring things up in an abusive way. Uh, I've sometimes thought of the uh, uh, ABCs, uh, things we're talking in uh, school letters, the ABCs of assertiveness. Well, A, you could bring something up in an accusatory way or abusive way. That's not good. Maybe a little bit better is to be blunt. You don't have the skills, but at least you say it. And then that gets it out there. Or you could bring it up with C in a considerate way, and that will invite conversation. Mm. So um, being obsessive and compulsive, I eventually stretch this out to a D, E, and F. <laughs> so even worse, the considerate is right in the middle. It's just right. But D would be deferential. You go through so many apologies and all, but you eventually get it out. The E would be evasive. That's not being very assertive. You're so evasive that you hardly ever get to the subject. And then F is to fail to bring it up at all. Mm -hmm. So, uh, assertiveness training, by the way, usually a person is in, is in their child. If they do assertiveness training correctly, they go to their adult. But usually if they do it wrong, they go to their critical parent and uh, be very assertive in a critical way that brings them right back to the same point of someone not wanting to talk to them. But you might have to go to the critical parent, at least initially in practice, to feel your power before you can go to your adult and learn how to bring things up in a straight way. Uh, next is the talk it up, which is uh, some people are very good at talking things through. Uh, they can stay on a subject and, and they don't get into a lot of side trips. And then other people uh, uh, right away get into games and, uh, and they don't get something talked through. Or every single time they talk something and then they talk it to death and they never get to the, uh, the wrap it up. Mm. Now, so I'm going I'm to flip the page over and we'll, we can come back to the wrap it up. There's a lot of different ways of wrapping it up that uh, we'll talk about. To wrap it up, it takes a lot of creativity and, and collaboration to get the closure. It's a whole different subject is how to come up with a new contract or a new change, <clears throat> a new commitment or some compensation or maybe confession 
or perpetuation. They always all start with C's. It took me a couple years to get 20 of them to start with C's. <laughs> so let's, let's go into the uh, talk it up. Okay, this is, this is a major idea that, that uh, I feel that, that I'd put right behind the drama triangle for ideas I've, I've worked out. Uh, there are four ways of blocking intimacy. You can be condescending, abrupt, secretive, and evasive. Let's just do a, a brief exercise. I want you to imagine that you are trying to talk to a person who does not want to hear you, who is blocking you out, and you're saying, I want to talk something over with you, and they're doing everything they can to prevent it. Okay, picture that scene. Of course, it could be you, and someone's trying to talk to you. It's a little easier to picture. Try and get through to someone who, who's doing everything they can to block you. Okay, condescending. They're looking down on what you're saying. They're saying, uh, this is BS. I don't want to talk about it. Talk about it with your therapist. Not another one of these, these uh, idiot things that you're bringing up. So they're looking down and diminishing what you're trying to do. Abrupt, they would suddenly cut you off and say, stop, I don't want to talk about it. Hey, stop, I'm walking out. Or they'd hang up the phone. Secretive, they'd withhold whatever information you need in order to talk it through. It could even be the strokes, the things they like about you withheld. Or they could have a whole dossier on all the negative things that they've collected about you, or the stamps that they've uh, collected on you. But you never get to get them. You can't solve it without the information. And the last is evasive, a person that changes the subject so quickly that you can't, you can't keep track of them. They take the subject away to something else, or they laugh it off, or they uh, make you forget your original topic. So those are the, um, the four ways of blocking intimacy, and we'll, we'll be doing an exercise where you can practice each one of those. Now there's also an intimacy uh, winner's loop, in which I use the same letters, naturally. And uh, uh, so instead of condescending, the person is cherishing. They highly value what you say. Mm. And, and instead of abrupt, they're very approachable. And just go up and say anything you want to the person. Instead of secretive, they're sharing. They give you all the information you need. They're willing to open up. And instead of evasive, they stay engaged on the subject, the same subject. You could have that in, a, in therapy. You can have a patient who, who looks down on or just ridicules or discounts whatever you say, they abruptly go back to their own subject and say, well, as I was saying, you know, as if you interrupted them with a lot of garbage or something, uh, or they could be secretive and withhold anything that, that uh, is relevant to what you said, or they could be evasive and you couldn't pin them down. Of course, they have script reasons for that, or they may think you're not safe or whatever. But imagine that the same person is, is, uh, is in the winner's loop, so they're cherishing. They really listen carefully and, and value what you have to say. Um, they're approachable. You can feel that with this person you can say anything you want. Uh, sharing, they'll share all the information, uh, all their thoughts about what you've talked about. And engage, they'll stay on the subject and really work on their contract. Likewise, if you're bringing something up with a partner, uh, they'll listen well and they'll, be, uh, they'll value what you have to say and cherish it and be approachable so you can bring up anything in the future. Now there is a seesaw that's very useful in couples therapy that sometimes the more aggressive one person is, the more passive the other one gets. Or more invasive one person gets, the more evasive the other one is. Mm. And it can start in either direction. Now so I have this intimacy invasive loser's loop, which is eager, relentless, and annoying person just peppers away trying to get answers, like maybe they're uh, speedy, needy, and feedy. Sounds like some door, seven dwarfs. But speedy is they're going faster than you can keep up with. Uh, uh, needy, they're going, they need more than you can give. And feedy, they're giving more than you want. Or they could bring things up, still being eager, relentless, and annoying, bring things up in a driving, droning, and dreary way. Or they could uh, be constantly critical and speechy, teachy, and preachy. Uh, imagine uh, going, trying to go to sleep at night and the person's preaching and teaching you uh, things mm -hmm. or at the dinner table. So the more one person is eager, relentless, and annoying, the more the other one becomes condescending, abrupt, secretive, and evasive. I had one couple I worked with some years ago where she was a very talkative person and he was quiet and that's why he married her. So the seesaw was okay. It was just good chemistry. 
when they first got together. See, so it's just tilted a little bit. As time goes on, uh, she tries to change him <laughs> to being more talkative, and he tries to change her into giving him a little time to talk himself. And the seesaw tilted so bad that he just eventually closed down and wouldn't talk to her, and she just banged at the door trying to get him to talk, and, and they were at an impasse. Okay, so those are the loser's loops. So when you're, this is in the bring it up, talk it up, wrap it up. This is one of the things that keeps people from being able to, to talk it all the way through. Also in Burns diagrams, you could have a cross transaction would be something that would keep something from being talked through. Next is uh, is discounting. The um, this is something I call the iceberg. See, haha, it looks like an iceberg, but it has little eyes in it, so it's, it's an iceberg. Um, this is a real disc. This is discounting. A person talks to the other person. Like this person talks, and they have a lot of, they think what they're bringing up is very important, but this other person just skims right off and doesn't even hear it. So the woman says, uh, you know, I'm really hurt that, that uh, when you came home, you broke your promise uh, to jog, and then he goes into a whole lot of reasons why he was doing this and that, but he never heard her feelings. Um, so he was discounting her feelings. Or she could bring up some information that was important. She's saying, well, these are the things I have to do first before I could clean up the kitchen. And he'd say, he'd change the subject and say, oh, it's the same old thing. But he wouldn't listen to the information. So what, when a person's a very fast listener and really hears almost nothing of what you've said, this is what I, the way I think. Uh, they're discounting the information. They're discounting the implications of it. The information may have a lot of there may be a lot behind the information or the complaint. There may be uh, a lot of history of other things to get into. So there's many sort of trees or roots behind what they're saying. The person who glances off the tip of the iceberg and doesn't see what's under the surface doesn't have any idea that there's a lot behind there, that, that it's a pathway to get into that. They also discount the intent. They assume the intent is negative, that, the, that uh, uh, someone's doing it in order to put them on the spot or to make them look bad rather than the attempt is one of problem solving. Ideally, the answer would be, if you bring up a complaint, is to air it out. And that's to give the other person an apology. apology. So he would say to her, uh, I'm sorry that, um, that I didn't come home in time for our jogging appointment. To give insight. And the insight's important, because just a superficial apology doesn't really work. She says, I have done this a lot. Uh, and I haven't listened to you, and you're right. Um, and here's some psychological reasons why I may be coming home when I want to. And then he takes responsibility, the, the R. Says that I'm, in the future, I will call you if I'm going to be home late, or for dinner, or for jogging, or whatever the issue is. And, uh, uh, and I do take responsibility also for having done it. So then she gets a complete airing out. The discount is lifted. She feels completely heard as opposed for him just to quickly change the subject and discount uh, all the information behind what she's saying or the implications or the meaning. So this is a discounting of words and feelings. Okay. Next, with this grand title, uh, this is a discount of person. And uh, on this one, uh, you don't listen to a person if you're discounting their essence of who they really are. You're only thinking of themselves as a partial person. If you're attributing less of themselves than, than is there. Now, a long time ago, I came up with this when, uh, when there was a lot of talk about discounting and TA and different theories of discounting. I came up with this as a discount of person. I gave it this name, Galloping Condescending Octanopia. I think because of the name, I never wrote it up because I thought the name was too silly. And it, I guess it comes from Galloping Consumption, which was a, an old name for mm -hmm. TV. But octanopia means that there's eight ways of discounting people. So let me uh, show you some of the ways. Above the li dotted lines is you discount their thinking. Below, in the middle, you discount their heart, uh, them as a human being. And below the dotted lines, you discount their sexuality. Going vertically to the left and the right, you discount their arms and legs, their ability to work is what that means. And in the middle is them as a human being, as a person. So let's go through a few of them. 
you put checks and X's by these in any combination, and there's eight combinations. That's why I called it octanopia, eight ways of being blind to people. So let's look at the egghead first. Okay, the egghead's got a lot of thinking. Now maybe he's got heart. Depends on how nerdy, if the person's a nerd, you might not think he has heart. But let's give the egghead a sense of heart. But maybe women, or the woman he goes after, just thinks of him as an egghead and that there's no sexuality. She's not turned on to him. So let's look at the, say, a woman who's called an airhead. Uh, pardon all the slang terms. But, uh, <laughs> okay, so airhead, will they give an X here? They'd say, well, she doesn't do any thinking. and, and uh, But she does have a heart. She has some feelings, and she, uh, to some men, should be very sexual because they could take advantage of her and fool her because she wouldn't figure out what's happening. So uh, that would be a stereotype of an earhead. That'd be check, uh, cross, check, check. And a meathead, you know, this would be um, the beer guzzling Neanderthal jerk uh, in this, that stereotype. So, uh, say a woman wouldn't give him credit for thinking or for having a heart, but but all he's thinking about is sex. Mm -hmm. So. Um, so you could read a person that way. Now maybe the meathead, you can, they wouldn't see them as a human being at all, but figure, well, they can work real hard, do construction work or things like that. Maybe they work real hard, but they're not, uh, there's no person in there. And you could stereotype either of these as uh, not having a person inside but able to work. However, with the airhead, you might say, well, yes, there's a person there. She can be a nice person, and men are airheads too. But uh, they wouldn't trust them for working because they would think the person would be scattered and, and um, superficial and so forth. So this is an attribution. As you look at a person, you're not seeing the whole person. And likewise, you can present yourself this way. You can, you can leave out some of these things. You could maybe gain to know somebody, leave out the fact that you can work or that you have sexuality or, or that you can think, think or that you have a heart. Maybe in singles getting to know each other, they wouldn't... Uh, go through the checklist. Okay, so that's discount of person. Oops. Okay, so now we get to um, to power. Uh, now power controls the flow of information. Uh, people who are into power uh, don't allow the other person to get their point across. They intimidate them one way or another. So the uh, the critical parent would intimidate a person, let's put an X here, a critical parent would intimidate a person by uh, being so sudden and so sharp and so abrupt with their reply, eventually the person's afraid to bring things up. So the man brings up to the woman, you know, we have a double standard. You know, you can bring up anything you want to me, but if I bring up something to you, oh, you throw a fit, you get mad, you put me down, you punish me, you <coughs> deny me sex, you, you make such a bad scene that uh, it's uncomfortable. So he could see her as using critical parent to control the flow of information. Oh, by the way, I have written up here the game player's three rules of miscommunication. Originally, I saw this as typical alcoholic behavior when you want to tell the alcoholic uh, not to drink or so forth. But it, it sort of comes out more as a sign of a dysfunctional family training. And the three rules of uh, game player's three rules of miscommunication are uh, make a game out of everything, deny everything, and immediately put the other person on the defensive. And whenever a really bad communication goes on, all three are happening fast. Mm -hmm. So you say to the, say the uh, alcoholic, uh, you know, I think you'd cut back on your drinking. Immediately the person puts, um, uh, says, what do you mean by drinking? Blah, blah, blah. So right away go into the drama triangle. It goes into a game. This person's the persecutor and they're the victim and why aren't they more understanding and so forth and, and you know, few, what's a few drinks anyway? Uh, they deny everything, say, I don't have a drinking problem. Maybe you do. You don't drink enough. So they de uh, or uh, what's a few drinks anyway? Uh, so, forth. so they deny that's a problem. And then they immediately put the other person on the defensive. They say, well, what about you? You got all these problems. So you don't really get your point across. It's Because you're, you're right all of a sudden on the, on the spot. You have to defend yourself. So sometimes anything you bring up just about to somebody, right away you're on the defensive. Say, well, what about you? What about you? Uh, the guy says to this, this one woman, uh, let's talk about a relationship. And she says, oh, you got another woman? Is there a problem? You know, right away, he's on the defensive. She's denying that there's a problem in the relationship. And um, 
a uh, lot of things, discounting information, a lot of things. So there are a lot of ways of intimidating people from uh, talking things through. A nurturing parent way of intimidating people would be to be so sweet and so kind that you just wouldn't have the heart to bring something up. They're so kind and so generous and they're so loving that you're interrupting their whole scene. In games people play, it's the game of greenhouse. A person is a tender flower in a greenhouse that only blooms once every hundred years. <laughs> The temperature's got to be right, and the pressure, and the humidity. Everything has just got to be perfect before you can bring something up. So this person is so sweet and so kind and so loving, you just haven't the heart to bring it up. But it's power. It's power because it controls your ability to bring things up. The person is not approachable because they're too kind, and how dare you bring things up. Okay, the adult can, can control uh, communication with power if, if it's an excluded adult. Um, if all the person will talk about is logic and uh, information, uh, and they'll right away dissect what you say. So the woman, say the woman talks to the man, we'll use our st stereotypes. All the sexual a activists stay on the alert. I'm using uh, stereotypes. So the woman says to the man, Let's, uh, I have, there's a problem in our relationship that, uh, that we need to talk about in order for me to feel more comfortable with you, which is an okay way of bringing it up. But he's, he's saying, uh, well, what is comfort? Or uh, He gets very intellectual about the whole thing and, and uh, right away goes to the blackboard and starts drawing some of my diagrams or something. And uh, so you can, the person being too intellectual and, and too logical, like the men say, well, well, let's be logical. Of course, that's his logic. You know. um, he defines the logic, so that's power. The power, power controls the information. Power controls who's right and who's wrong. Power controls, controls the setting or, or what you can talk about, or the power controls the punishments. Uh, and these come up in just everyday relationships, not only between countries and nations. Okay, the free child can control information by being so happy that no one wants to interrupt their fun. They're having a good time, they're playing Murgatroyd, I'm <laughs> wonderful, everything's wonderful, you're so wonderful. So they're, they're having so much fun that you just don't want to interrupt it. But it's power. It keeps you from bringing up what you want. Anytime you can't bring up what you want to someone, there's a game going on. And the game will be in games people play, one of those games, almost for sure. Mm. But you can think of it in terms of power that they're controlling it. So the person is too happy to confront, okay? You just, but it does keep you, and they know what they're doing. At one level, all these people know that what they're doing is power, but they deny it. And then uh, the adapted child has power to control the relationship and that they're so hurting and so so miserable and they're suffering so much. Oh, don't bring anything else up. God, I've got too much on my mind. You know, but you get that enough that the person shatters and becomes a basket case with almost anything you want to talk about. Then you got an idea that, that uh, maybe there's some control and some power behind it. So these are ways of controlling, subtle ways, because you wouldn't necessarily think of it, subtle ways of controlling the ability to talk things over with somebody. You can also think, look at this in terms of the, uh, the drama triangle, the persecutor, rescuer, and victim triangle, that if the person's the persecutor, you bring something up to them, you know, adult to adult, and right away they become persecutor and say, stop doing that to me. Why are you doing this to me? And they turn it into a a drama where you're the persecutor and they're the victim, and they only leave you one choice of being the rescuer and saying nothing about it and, and just stuffing it. Or you can control as the victim, which we've talked about a little bit. The person is so much of a victim that, that uh, if you say something, immediately they become a victim, or they play the role of victim so much because they've learned this in their life that people won't expect as much of them and, and you can't bring things up to them. Or they could be the rescuer. They could be so nice to everybody and, and you know, uh, reaching out so much to people and reaching out so much to you that, that it keeps you from bringing things up. Or they could turn into rescuer and say, oh, be nice to people. You, don't, you shouldn't be uh, like that. Be more, a nice of a person. So uh, this, these, these drama roles can also be used to, uh, to control uh, the flow of information and defining who's right and who's okay and what's, um, and what's okay to talk about what isn't. But these are power. And whenever you can't talk something over the person, there's a game going on. Mm. You can either look at it as one of their ego states is, is controlling you, or they're going to swing you right into the drama triangle and, and stop what, 
what's uh, going on. Okay, thank you very much.